every new MMO actually releasing in 2024. Please tell me they're good. Annual installment of what new MMOs are coming out this year. Hey, fun fact about the series, some of the games on this list were also on the first one we made back in 2016. Another Delays. fun fact, some of these games will development Hold games. Whoa, whoa, are... whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Um quality, let's just make sure it stays at that quality. MMOs are coming out this year. Hey, fun fact about the series, some of the games on this list were also on the first one we made back in 2016. Another fun fact, some of these games will absolutely be on next year's list as well. A testament not just to the extremely long Beautiful. They will be on next year's list because they fucking lied to us. And a lot of the time they're trying to generate hype and then they delay it because they realize that their game is dog shit and they don't know how to plan a time schedule and they've delayed it five times. And we keep, I've like realized this very recently is that we as MMO gamers, we keep forgiving these people for putting all these fucking delays out there. But they, they keep doing this because they're pushing for a timeline that is so unrealistic because no one in their project management teams has the slightest fucking clue about what they're doing or the marketing side of it is pushing so goddamn hard for a release that they don't understand that the project's gonna flop. Um, but there's an internal clash that keeps on happening in video games that needs to be fixed. Because with so many fucking delays happening all the time, it's now 2024, you cannot blame COVID, you cannot blame all this other shit, it is entirely your studio's fault. If you are not gonna release a game, and you need an extra year, don't fucking give us a release date. I would rather hear zero release dates, and then just one day, here like three months before it's actually going to be out. Hey, by the way, our game's done. We're putting it out. That would be so much better than this this continual fucking sick hype cycle where we get, we get bullshitted about, oh, it's going to come out this year. Oh, wait, no, it's next year. Oh, wait, no, no, no. It's next, next year. Development time MMOs require, but also to how early we hear about some of them. In particular, much of that crowdfunded bunch, a few of which we've known about for, uh, I don't know, hey, a decade now. Anyway, taking a look ahead, I wanted to try to paint a clear picture of exactly what we're expecting. Like, what That's new actually, MMOs will finally release and be playable in 2024? That is the question. I'm looking to answer and address here today. Now, first up on our list and pretty much the most guaranteed surefire bet is the release of Throne and Liberty, mainly because this game has actually already released, but in Korea and will be getting a global launch sometime in early 2024. Throne and Liberty, I'm on the fence about making a video about because I don't think it's going to be a game that has a long-term player base. It's already floundering in Asia. All the loot box and, and uh, monetization and all the fucking pay-to-win bullshit that they've got in the game is just going to make it another one of those games where people stop giving a fuck. I, I haven't looked enough into the Throne and Liberty stuff, but what I know is that the more you monetize a game, the more resources you pull from developing a game because a larger part of your team is dedicated to... Um, the monetary cash shop bullshit instead of actually like building out your your game according to what we've heard now despite a poor reception to its beta from last summer i am still holding on to a glimmer of hope Wait, hold, yeah yeah it is gonna snow i can't reasons. believe i'm streaming For one they've listened to and implemented changes based on beta feedback seemingly addressing the major complaints by improving combat and removing all of the autoplay mobile features None of that matters. None of the autoplay mobile features matter if the game is still monetized up its own asshole. And two, barring those changes are good enough, the base core of the game sounds really awesome. Beyond offering the standard suite of content that most open world MMOs have, Throne in Liberty in particular boasts a few interesting features. So yes, it's got an open world, they say it's seamless with zero loading screens, instant fast travel, but mainly the fact that it supports a very large number of simultaneous players. We have seen screenshots with hundreds and hundreds of players on screen, and the game looks pretty good on top of that to boot as an Unreal Engine 4 game even without upgrading to UE5, eh. the visuals are a selling point for me from the raw gameplay that I've seen and by all- The visuals are good, but like, uh, do Quinfall too. You know what? I need to look into Quinfall because I don't know nearly enough about Quinfall. So I need to look into Ashes Alpha 2. 
I'll look into Quinfall as well, for a filter. Thank you for pointing that well, out. This is a pretty good looking game and beyond looking good, it appears to have some great clarity and render distance, which make that open world that's seamless with tons of players all that much more impressive. They do have the expected assortment of biomes. There's fantasy and medieval inspired locations with both PVE and PVP offerings. On the PVE side, there's a big focus on difficult group content. We've Chrono seen quite a Odyssey. few large scale boss battles with both instance and open world. You know, Chrono Odyssey was completely, completely um, memory hold for me. And I just realized my chat's not on screen. Chrono Odyssey was memory hold for me. I didn't even know it was still coming out. That's another one world encounters they've got solo challenges like this boss tower rush there's a fully open world multi-layer non-instance dungeon system kind of along the lines of i don't know i think of something like public dungeons in eso but much bigger fully open world more sprawling and with a lot more players pvp will include small scale skirmishes large open world battles where players fight over territory or bosses there's castle sieges with that hundreds doesn't look of players good. that looks really bad so just watch this World, again, multi-layer. Where he non talks about the PvP and then look at what the PvP looks like. Don't listen to the words, just look at the PvP from a purely analytical perspective. The PvP does not look good. PvP will include this. small this right here does not look good. Something looks wrong about this. Small scale skirmishes, large open world battles, where play that that right there. That kind of behavior. That whatever's going on there, something feels off. Something feels really off about the PvP there. And I'm a PvP enjoyer. Players fight over territory that or bosses. Something feels the very clunky there. Hundreds of players defending and attacking. They've got this really cool dynamic weather and time of day system that directly affects enemies, your abilities, and even the terrain. So this includes doing things like making enemies stronger or weaker depending on the weather, or enhancing or debuffing player abilities, or restricting and or opening up access to various parts of the world besides weather. So, okay, I've thought about this weather stuff a lot, and it sounds good on paper, right? But what it means is that people are going to choose classes that are going to be the most consistent instead of the most fun, right? Because people min-max the shit out of most stuff. If you don't min-max the shit out of most stuff, congratulations, you are the minority. You are not the person who does that. It means that, like, let's say you play a fire mage, right? You are going to be far less consistent than if you played an assassin who's not affected by the weather. I think most are pre-generated like the day before trailers. Probably. Um, this game exists. I think that's the difference, is this game exists. The day, day before wasn't really a game so much as um, uh, an April Fool's joke that was put together and put out to people. Whether the day-night cycle also plays into this as well. There's a ton of traversal features with you being able to mantle and climb most of the environment. You got a grapple hook and can transform into a variety of animals. And the game features a classless system where you are not locked into a role or class when making a character. Instead, your skills and abilities are determined by whatever two weapons you choose to equip, much along the same lines of what you see in something like New World or Albion Online. Yeah, mm. Throne of Liberty sounds really great on many, many levels. I think one of the biggest sticking points at it sounds great on paper. On paper, it sounds fantastic. I don't think it's going to be that in reality. At the moment, it's definitely going to be the game's monetization. Now, they've promised no yep, pay to win. Is. However, we do know that the main currency in the play... There's no, guys, there's no pay to win. There's just pay for convenience. Guys, there's no pay to win. You just get a, um, better visuals than other people. Guys, there's no pay to win. It's just you move a little bit faster. Guys, there's no pay to win. You just earn experience faster than everyone else if you give us money. That's what you're going to hear from NCSoft specifically. Player trading auction house is paid for real money premium currency. We know that the game will utilize a gear upgrade system, a popular in many Eastern MMOs, where you start with base pieces of gear and then spend resources to rank it up. However, the higher you go, while it gets stronger, it's also- a God, Guys, there's no pay to win, but you can buy resources off the store to upgrade your gear that makes your gear better than everyone else. That's not pay to win because there's a degree of separation there. I've heard every excuse under the fucking sun about pay to win. Holy shit.
more likely to fail, although at least in Throne and Liberty's case, there is no downgrading and even a quote fail will provide some sort of an upgrade, even if it's just a small percentage towards a 100% next uh, upgrade tier, which really to me sort of sounds like they're just surfacing a built-in pity system or something like this. Like, yes, you can fail a bunch, but eventually you will fill up the bar and succeed. It's not a pity system. It's a gambling system. The casino keeps you coming back by letting you win small and lose big. It's the same in gaming. It's the same psychology that they're applying. They hire experts from gambling fucking casinos now for video games so that they make sure that their gotcha systems or their loot box systems operate on the same psychological psychological principles that they can use to manipulate you into this. Oh, I lost nine times, but this tenth time I got a boot. It was the best boot? No, but it was a boot, so there's a chance of winning next time. Uh, there's no tax. They are just emergency upgrades. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Fuck it out. Indeed or you will get a successful upgrade. And while it is good that the game doesn't have any loot boxes or gacha mechanics, and then will instead focus on battle pass subscriptions, cosmetics, and the auction house transactions, we do know that they will be some sort of like pay to skip stuff. Now, as mentioned, Throne in Liberty- uh, Oh, oh guys, there's no pay to, there's no pay to win, but there's pay to skip. You can skip through entire chunks of the fucking game. Oh. Imagine designing a game so shitty that you can pay money to not play the game. <laughs> like, how many levels of copium do you think you have to be on to open up a video game? And then, like, let's say you paid, like, $40 for a video game, and then you pay an extra $10 to not play, like, 30% of that video game. You're just like, nah, I'll just skip the section. Just, like, just, just get this the fuck out of there. That means you made a shitty section in your video game. ...has already released with the launch of its Korea version happening on December 7th. Feedback has been slowly trickling out. We're starting to see impressions and reviews. And it seems as expected and as I kind of had hoped, people have a generally positive impression of they do? the gameplay and the systems, the content. Well, fuck, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just a cynical fuck. The game playing part of the game seems pretty good, but a lot of people at the same time are not terribly thrilled about the monetization. Surprise. Hey, there we go. Okay, at least I'm half right here. So I think I think there's something wrong with the gameplay from what I can see, but if other people have experienced it and like it, take their opinion over mine. Surprise. Now changes can be made. It is possible. There might be some differences between this version of the game and the one that we get globally and here in the West. We'll have to wait and see. Like mentioned, a global release for Throne and Liberty is planned for early 2024. Although as of this recording, who's publishing? Who's publishing Throne and Liberty? Who's the who's the Western publisher? There's gonna be changes, guys. There's gonna be so few small little changes and adjustments, and it's probably getting around certain European laws more than anything else, or covering up the titties in-game, covering up the best assets that the game has, and then releasing it to the West, just like they're gonna do with Blue Protocol. No exact date has been announced. I do think there's a strong possibility we find out sometime soon. Dune Awakening is an open world survival oh, hello. MMO being developed by Funcom. Now this studio is probably best known for their multiplayer survival game Conan Exiles, but they also have a long history of making the more traditional style MMO, including Anarchy Online back in 2001 and Age of Conan in 08. Now for their next game, it looks like they will be combining this past experience, making something that pulls a bit from both of these genres. They have said that Dune Awakening will have the social interactivity of large-scale persistent multiplayer games while also hmm. including unique and ambitious survival mechanics. All of this set in a vast and seamless world, the Dunes of Arrakis, that will be inhabited and shared by thousands of players. Now, when they say shared by thousands in my- I'm, I'm a massive Dune fan. I'm a, a huge Dune simp. So I'm going to have to think about making a video for this one. Even if everything they've said is an absolute lie, the fact that they said the thousands of players concerns me because as we've seen, thousands of players might mean 1,001 players on a server because server tech is not 
like not that great for handling that many players without some kind of loading separation or or like um layering or something like that so that concerns me a little bit i had i think yeah simultaneously all on the same server which would be pretty impressive considering their plans for large-scale battles so the game will feature third-person combat that will have both small-scale engagements and massive battles total war is what they're referring to this as and when hmm. further discussing the sort of encounters we can expect it actually sounds like they're planning something akin to a battlefield or planet side experience so you'll have ground troops running around with ranged and melee weapons there's also some elements of magic in this game they'll be skirmishing in groups or solo players trying to sneak behind enemy lines, capture resources, and stuff like that. While simultaneously, other players will be controlling an assortment of both ground and air vehicles. They say that we can expect a fast-paced interplay between infantry, ground, and flying vehicles, all fighting for key points of interest and resources like spice. How do they balance that? There's too many questions I have about this as a, a main form that drives the game's progression. So again, if it is true that they deliver on thousands of players on a server with this large-scale combat, that would be pretty impressive. But we'll have to wait and see whether they go with that dedicated server shards where there are literally thousands of people in your field of view, or if it's more phasing and instance, instancing through the... It'll, it'll probably be phasing and instancing. And they'll say thousands of players because now it's the marketing time. It's the time of the marketing not the time of the uh, disappointing, which is after the game releases. Use of mega servers. Now, outside of that, Dune Awakening will have most of the expected survival game features. There is base building. There's crafting of gear and vehicles. There are survival mechanics like thirst will play look, a big role. Look, it's the big uncircumcised worm. But probably one of the more interesting selling points and features for this game it all revolves around its setting. So in the world of Dune, the environment is a constant threat, and as such, massive sandstorms regularly change the landscape. This will mean areas that you visited the day prior could become buried, but at the same time, the shifting sands will reveal new locations and secrets, from resources to crashed ships and ancient testing stations. After a storm comes by, when the dust settles, players will then compete, scouting the fresh new landscape to see what was uncovered. And then there are the sandworms. Now, these are drawn to disturbances including things like combat so those large battles we talked about the longer they go on hmm. the more gunfire and the more commotion that gets kicked up the more likely a sandworm is to be drawn to it and appear emerging from the sand and swallowing everything in its path uh if one so can you be like the suicide the suicide fucking um guy you just start shooting at the sand while everyone else is battling around you and you just fuck up the whole fight by getting everyone eaten by the worm. Uh, because if the worm is not large scale enough, it, it's going to be very disappointing. Like the, the dune worms are fucking massive, dude. They're like twice the size of beluga whales or some shit. They're huge. One shows up and you are in its mouth vicinity you are basically done for and if i recall correctly they have talked about some sort of gear loss upon death or something like that because yes there are many survival elements in this game now unfortunately semi loot pvp fuck yeah Unfortunately, as of yet, we have not actually seen any raw gameplay. Most of the details and information about Dune Awakening have come from marketing and interviews and their website. We did, however, get that pre-alpha trailer with some in-engine footage, which I thought looked good. But of course, we will have to wait and see until we actually see the game running, controlled by a player, or better yet, get to play the game ourselves. Uh, but from what I've seen and heard so far, I think this one seems promising. Dune Awakening okay. is... Okay, okay, you know what? You know what? I'm enough of a simp for Dune that yeah i'll definitely make a video of that one i'll definitely make a video of that one even if it's like absolutely dog shit enter steam early i love dune enough that i'll do it they have already begun beta testing and have actually had a few rounds already in fact they're still actively testing as far as i'm aware and you can register to enter and be accepted over on their website once human is a third person open world mmo that heavily combines systems and mechanics from both the looter shooter and survival games genre now this one kind of came out of nowhere and has been a real <sighs> Is it just me or does this look like a phone game? It's, I, I don't know what it is, but whenever I see this kind of layout, like where you see like the UI in the right and the left corners, like pushed off to the sides here, um, and the way the characters move, I immediately think phone game. 
real pleasant surprise. I played it for a few days recently as part of a sponsorship, but then once that was done, I kind of just kept on playing, and it's been that way for nearly a week. So this game reminds me a lot of other games that I've okay, enjoyed. That's a good sign. It's like a mix of The Division, Defiance, Secret World, and survival stuff all put on top of it. We got a lot of survival in our MMOs nowadays, but I guess that's just how it is. So yes, on one hand, it feels just like an open world looter shooter, a la The Division, Defiance, or even Firefall. You'll go around the open world hmm. doing PVE stuff, fighting enemies and bosses, collecting materials and loot. This world is completely open. There's no loading screens as you're walking around and moving through the zones. And you'll see all of the usual expected flora and fauna of the different biomes that you explore, but jam-packed within Loser shoots a bad sign for me. Ah, that's fair. I'm I'm 50-50 on this one. It might be good. Um, it depends how good it's done. Um, it, it's kind of like I said before. It's like you can make the same level of MMO as someone has made before. And your MMO will automatically fail. Not because it's bad, but because it's just not better than the thing people are already playing. So this one's a question of... Does it do something better and, and more unique than something else? In that is a lot of locations, points of interest, and activities to do that kind of fill that shooting game, looking for loot, harvesting resources. So first there are the strongholds, and this is really like the primary form of open world PvE activity. These are basically... Hold on, I gotta, I, I gotta check something up. This is like bothering me now. A free action game for mobile devices, get fucked. That right there tells me that's the death knell for me. Not because I automatically hate phone games, but because I hate the culture around phone games. What this tells me is that the cash shop is going to be the biggest piece of this game, um, that it's going to be highly manipulative, and it's going to be very clunky if you try and play the same thing on PC that's going to be played on a phone. I thought so, based on the way the UI is set out, because this is a phone game UI, so, yeah, not surprising. Not surprising. Uh, locations will consist of various settlements, outposts, hospitals, military bases, all sorts of things that will have a number of objectives within them that you go to complete for experience and loot. This will include things typically Ooh. like killing X number of enemies, this list is uh, disappointing me. or bosses, finding crates like weapon and gear caches, or these mysterious treasures. But beyond this sort of base checklist of objectives, most strongholds that we've seen have had basically hidden side quest or objectives as well. Like you might come across an area where you see a power down elevator and then you see nearby there is a fuse box and you need to find and place a fuse in it doing so then powers up the elevator letting you take it to the top where you'll find a hidden boss or a loot chest or maybe in one town you come across a ghost who is in need of help and leads you to tracking down all sorts of clues in the area that eventually reveal their grave site and have its own reward or maybe exploring one stronghold you come across these pieces of paper i can't tell if that thing like wriggling in the air there over here is meant to be doing that or whether that's it's a bug overboard. or maybe i would assume it's a, it's meant to be doing that of paper with cryptic clues and numbers on them and it turns out these were the number combinations for a locked container it just seems like a lot if not most of the strongholds will have these extra layers beyond the, that checklist of objectives that i've really appreciated there's like something additional to discover about these areas rather than just killing enemies how do you think this man stays so positive about all these mmos like do you think it's do you think it's money do you think it's he understands that he can't be negative because it's his job or do you think like maybe he genuinely does enjoy a game like that i can't decide he's paid hard i you see the thing is i don't know if he was paid for this video because he's talking about multiple games and usually if you get paid to talk about a game they don't like it Unless it's specified we want a 30 second burn in, they don't like it if you make a video that includes other games an opening chest. Outside of strongholds, there's all sorts of different world events, uh, dynamic events that can pop up as you explore. Like we'd be walking around and we'd see this fog roll in with a warning timer. And then inside of the fog were all these like crazy enemies. And then if you kill them in time, you get some loot. There are That's literally a fucking siren head stolen from a few years back. I can't blame them for that. That was a that was a pretty cool idea.
roaming world bosses. At one point, I was in my base, I looked out the window, and there was a school bus with six legs stampeding across. I tried shooting it, and it said it was immune. I had no idea what was going on. We also saw this, like, massive, like, uh, four or five story That's interesting. tall giant with a flowery head that emerged out of a screen at an amphitheater. Like, really, really interesting stuff. There's, like, horde mode activities that can appear in the world where you gotta fight off waves of PvE enemies. And there's all sorts of other points of interest uh, outside of those... The enemies are interesting, but the animations are kind of, like, killing the vibe. In strongholds, there's a bunch of different smaller enemy camps where you can find things and kill enemies. There are NPC This is 100% a phone game. This is not something you should be playing on a PC. Towns with vendors and side quests. There's teleportation towers. There are boss fights. These are called monoliths. We've already fought a few. There was the foul shadow hunter, which was like this twisted mutant with a gun for a hand and had all sorts of different things like summoning up ads and shooting rockets and spewing out poison pools. And then there was this tree ant boss, this big tree creature that summoned giant uh, tentacle branches and spit out bubbles that would track us down. It even shot down a, a freaking laser beam. And on top of these boss fights, there are additional kind of more typical group dungeons that you can do. The game's got pvp with open world pvp events areas that are marked on the map where if you walk into it you're flagged for pvp you compete for rewards there's also base rating mechanics if you go on pvp servers it's like pvp all the time you can actively attack other players bases and that is just like the kind of mmo looter shooter side of the game there's like 50 percent of the game that's also straight up survival games survival systems like stamina sanity hydration and hunger there's full-on base building with blueprints and all sorts of besides constructing a building you can do all these crafting stations refineries there's like base defenses there's of course gathering to go along with this crafting and base building there are mobile camps that act as respawn points you can do as you're out exploring difficult areas there's ton of progression systems like this cradle that you have on your back that unlocks blueprint uh, for base building and also has these power-ups called overrides there's a whole blueprint system where most of the game pretty much all all of the gear in the game comes through crafting, okay let's keep player, going yeah. yeah there's a lot to this game it's a fairly I'm, I'm not kidding i can rant about story elements for fucking ever because i'm like i'm a massive law nerd and i've always been and for the longest time in my life i was too embarrassed to say it but now i just literally do not give a fuck dense and kind of interesting combination of different genres and and frankly why i'm most excited is because yes it reminds me of, of a lot of games that i've played and enjoyed in the past now all of that said there's a real high possibility that this game will have yes some so for some form of pay to win and pay to progression that's pretty much o almost guaranteed in fact already we know that the higher rarity star rating blueprints for gear has some sort of gacha system tied into it to unlocking and getting those a higher highest tiers of gear but that said i've played like 30 hours now at the point of this recording and i have not even really seen this stuff come into effect although it is a beta so maybe it's not as it will be at launch but already there is just a lot of game here there's a lot of game that i've enjoyed and there are still things that i'm discovering every time that i play it's just been a real pleasant surprise i gotta tell you so once human is I, I i feel i don't know i don't i don't think i trust him on this one maybe i'm just too jaded about this but i don't trust him with this game with once human to release in 2024 and whatever comes to the game's monetization i i do have to say the content and features wide at the moment this is one of my more anticipated mmos of this year this isn't an, this isn't another sponsor from the spot like it's just I, it just this game took me by surprise pleasantly but yeah that said as far as we know it's got gotcha and probably will have pay to win so if that's a deal breaker for you i totally understand right blue protocol this is an action combat anime mmo from bandai namco now similar to throne in liberty this game has Oof. actually already released i have zero hopes for this game zero fucking hopes because i played this game for like a month and a half um getting banned on and off for not being japanese and Amazon's like, guys, we're going to change the game drastically. They're not going to fucking change the game drastically. They're going to cover up the titties. They're going to cover up the ass. And then they're going to be like, the game is completely different. And nothing else is going to have changed. And it's still going to be a gambling shitbox of a game. In certain parts of the world with a global version planned for 2024. Oh, and another oh. wait, 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 wait. There is a video I have to do about uh, Blue Protocol this year. Because there were a bunch of React streamers who saw my um, video and they were like, This guy's talking good bullshit. This guy's capping. This game's going to be amazing. It's going to be the next World of Warcraft. And I cannot wait. I cannot wait to be right about this. God, I, ho I wish I was wrong, but I know I'm not. Because I went through the same thing. I suffered when I thought New World was going to be like the next big thing. 
and now they have to suffer because I hurt inside. <laughs> Similarity is that both games global versions are being published by Amazon, which will get to that significance in just a moment. Now, I gotta say, I quite like the look of Blue Protocol, although anime isn't a personal interest or hobby of mine. The visuals and gameplay of this thing look fantastic. Like, I'm really impressed with how slick, smooth, responsive, and impactful combat appears to be. One big downside for this one, though, is that it's not an open world MMO. Instead, it's we're getting a lobby-based shared world with instant lobby-based shared world, and in each lobby, you can only see 30 players three zero that's it and guess what 30 players is still enough that if they're camping on the same quest you will be waiting there if you do not tag a mob with one hit for fucking hours at a time zones loading screens between them and player caps it appears that most zones will have a max capacity of 30 players i think towns are said to be around 200 people but outside of that blue there protocol does have the standard suite of offerings for theme park mmos plenty of pve content with dungeons and raids various forms of pvp there's gear crafting and life skills social hubs and a variety of zones with different biomes to explore and hidden when zones. when they say plenty of pve what they mean is for each level bracket there is one dungeon that you can go to. That's it. There are no other extra dungeons. There's one. There is the beginning dungeon, and then there's the next dungeon after that as you level up, and the next dungeon after that as you level up. There are not multiple widespread world dungeons. So that's deceptive. Secrets like a chest and discoverable pets. There are several classes to choose from. These include filling the roles of sword and board tank, melee brawler, ranged bow user, a ranged elemental mage, and a few others. Each of these classes can equip up to four base skills that can be strengthened and modified with skill points. You basically can select various combinations of abilities and modifiers to sort of customize your play style. And then there are these things called monster skills, these mystical echoes, which are like spiritual remnants of creatures you interact with that can unleash powerful attacks for you in battle i actually don't quite understand this one now, okay so i understand the monster ecosystem what happens is it's an ability you summon a creature and it fights with you and then when it does a little bit of damage there he goes the man with the world's smallest cock what a brave soul uh anyway when these summons are summoned they do a little bit of damage they do their ability and they disappear to put it into perspective there's an alcoholic 300 year old vampire who looks like a 12 year old little girl and how do they prove that she's over age well her ability is that when you summon her she throws a fucking bottle of alcohol at the enemy and stuns them i'm not i'm not joking i'm not kidding also expect that to be removed from uh, the Western version of the game, which is going to make the version that's in the West even worse. The motorcycle man might watch your streams. No, he's too busy trying to die on the roads. Prior to launching in Japan, it was said that Blue Protocol would have zero pay to win. But no. wouldn't you know, no. it turns out they might have pay to win. Now, they are focusing monetization, they say, on a season pass and cosmetics, but they said... Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, season pass and cosmetics and the mounts and the gear and the armor and the upgrades um, and the gacha system, right? So when they say there is no pay to win, they are fucking lying through their teeth. And anyone who disagrees with me on that point needs to take the big fat fucking corporate cock out of their mouth and stop sucking them off. For like maybe just five seconds, take a break. I'm sure your jaw is just in intense amounts of pain from that. Hey, no power or progression. But now that the game is out, we do know that there are gotcha mechanics in the game. It appears to yep. have some form of pay for power. From what I understand, there they are not only there's not only one cash shop. There are two separate cash shops in this game, and the second cash shop is accessed by spending enough money and failing enough times on the first cash shop. That's a gotcha system to get to the second cash shop. So if you want everything, you're going to sp be spending thousands of dollars on this game, thousands to get the thing you want. There's this ticket system that is used to boost your weapon's crafting rate. Uh, speaking of which, yes, this game utilizes a gear upgrade or honing system where you have to enhance your weapons with these plugs and sockets, which require rolling the dice for a chance to fail, but that chance can be mitigated by using those gotcha tickets. So yeah, in other words, it's another convoluted system of upgrades and enhancements win. designed to push you towards spending money in the cash shop or yep. in the loot box, basically, the gotcha system. Uh, as usual with this style of game, we'll get what enjoyment we can out of it before running into the paywall, right? That's the most we can hope for uh, one no. month a month and a half you get to max level 
you don't want to play with the gacha system and you're like all right i'm at max level i'm out and you never look at this game again blue protocol will be free to play it is currently planned to release in 2024 on pc playstation and xbox all oh and by the way that's the excuse they're going to use is the game is free to play therefore um it's fine that they charge you for the shit bullshit bullshit it is free to walk into a casino until you sit down at the slot machine firm date for that global launch has been announced yet now going back to the fact that uh, blue protocol and throne of liberty are both being published by amazon now what that means is we should expect the release dates for both of these games to be fairly spread apart now so if it does end up being the case that throne of liberty comes in early 2024 that would mean we should expect blue protocol to release in late 2024 uh, but certainly not within the same quarter that would be a massive surprise all right next up we got core punk this is a game that we've been keeping track okay. of for quite some time okay this is is what i'm actually interested in i'm actually interested interested bleh, to see where core punk goes because i said that this was a game to avoid and i said this not because um i thought it was well i did think it was going to be bad but i think i've changed my mind about this one i think core punk has a better chance as an mmo than all the other shit i've seen so um i'd like to probably do a core punk video at some point I think this one's changed my mind uh, just because of what I've seen that they've kept on pushing the development. Um, I just didn't expect it to release within that year and it didn't. And I'm kind of glad it didn't. Um, they they already harvest data for, data for ads. It isn't free. Yeah, of course it's not. Um, they know exactly what po porn you're jerking off to. They don't need to even look it up. They're like, look at your face and they're like, oh, you're that guy. Uh, the best MMO of 2024 will be probably be a shitty barely playable um, Ashes of Creation Alpha 2. Probably. Probably. And that's kind of sad. Top-down MMO that looks to play fairly similar to a MOBA just set in an MMO world. It's got mouse click movement, a relatively slow pace of combat, skill shots that need to be aimed, and a class system that has you selecting from a roster of heroes rather than creating a character from scratch. Now, That's the part that I think sucks the most about this game, right? Is you are not creating your own personal like character with their own themes and unique things. You are, you are selecting from like a list and then you are making adjustments to that character from predefined selection slots that belong all the way back in 2005. Right? You are not made, you don't have sliders to adjust your character. Now, even though it's a top-down game, they do say it's got a big, seamless open world. We'll explore these zones, various biomes, like forests and deserts and all sorts of stuff. And these will be uh, filled with enemies and camps, ruins, caves, strongholds, along with small villages or large cities full of NPCs and other players. We'll do the expecting, questing, leveling, uh, grinding for loot and gearing up. There are multiple heroes to choose from, like we said. Instead of making a class, you're picking a default hero that has, like, its own name and backstory. But these will come with three different masteries, which basically act as specializations with their own corresponding set of skills and abilities. Group PvE content includes dungeons. They'll be handcrafted and procedurally generated varieties. There's also raids and other large scale group challenges. There's a big emphasis in this game on the fog of war mechanic, like many top down games or like- uh, If the world is expansive, it could be interesting. I think so. Um, my question, so my big question for this game, right? Uh, this is a question I ask for every other game. Why would people play this game instead of another game that is similar to it? So this one's big competitor would be something like Albion Online, right? And the big question would be, why would you play Core Punk instead of Albion Online? I don't have an answer for it. And that's not Core Punk's fault. It's not anything they've done wrong. It's just I don't have enough information to make that like that analysis. MOBAs, this is said to uh, incentivize exploration and discovery. PvP will have a range from open world where you can use that fog of war to sneak up on other players to more structured fights in like arenas and battlegrounds. I'm, I'm actually really curious about the PvP of this game because to me this game seems very slow and um, very like molasses like and i wonder if that's gonna make this game so that there's no one shot mechanics happening and so you always have time to react to what other people are doing 
or if it's just going to make it feel frustrating to try and move around. Other traditional MMO systems include crafting and gathering, farming, pack deliveries, epic quests, guild systems, and more. Now, gear in the game is purely cosmetic, apparently. The hero power and progression comes mainly via these artifacts that will affect your abilities, as well as give you access to new powers and boost your stats. This, along with further customization that can be done by leveling up your hero. Hey, that's actually not bad. I like that. Old school talent trees. With further customization that can be done by leveling up your hero and selecting from multiple different playstyle focused skill trees. And all of this, once again, in that top down perspective, sort of like a MOBA uh, with MOBA like mechanics moving your character, interacting with objects, attacking enemies, all done by clicking things with your mouse. So, development of Core Punk has been trucking along in the past months. They've held several first look play tests with blogs recapping those experiences. They do have a test scheduled for this month, and I do plan to check that out. Uh, expect more coverage from me on core punk sometime soon as of today core punk is targeting a 2024 release and it does seem like they are on track to hit it project lll this mm. is an open world mmo looter shooter it's going to have seamless exploration and takes place in an alternate reality version of seoul south korea this will include a mixture of city wilderness outdoor and indoor environments all with a touch of sci-fi and fantasy and a lot of other dimensional stuff going on in this game uh, all these spaces and locations will be full of an assortment of enemies uh, this is primary faction of cyborgs along with your typical MMO open world activities events points of interest and other players the game has PvE with public events dungeons and raids as well as PvP offering both competitive modes and open world fighting besides third person shooting and the standard assortment mm. of weapons in a game like this there's also a ton of high tech themed gadgets and abilities like invisibility cloaks scouting drones grav grenades missile launchers aimbot ultimates jetpacks and bullets. you see the you see the spaghetti noodles in the top right corner this is what makes me concerned that it's going to be a massive pay to win game. So whenever you see that Korean writing right there, right? The wacky noodles. That that's when you know that the game is going to be very predatory. Korean companies are very fucking predatory with their games deflecting bubbles vehicles will also have a big presence both land and air there's also this like titanfall-esque mech system where these titans fall from the sky and you can jump in them and control them and blow stuff up now not too long ago we saw some raw gameplay at a live stream event and honestly it didn't look all that bad we saw players dropping into this open world environment and just doing basic open world stuff going around clearing enemies Fortnite! <laughs> He's using abilities, completing objectives, rescuing stuff, bunch of different raw gameplay. We saw group play. We saw boss encounters. We saw different public events. Seemed like it was not bad. Now, I gotta say, though, after recently playing... Is it just me, or is the animation cycle of the way those characters walk and the positioning of the camera exactly where your character is in Fortnite? Is that just, like, am I, am I just having a stroke, or is that what I'm seeing here? once human project LLL doesn't look as impressive as I initially thought it was but we have only seen bits and pieces of gameplay that there was like a 45 minute live stream and it didn't really show much in terms of systems and features it was just pretty bog standard open world character mm. drops in you shoot enemies you do a couple of objectives which in this case uh they were mostly just like interacting yeah. with terminals yeah I don't trust it I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bother with uh project triple L but I am still holding out hope. I do think that this game has a good premise. It has an interesting setting. And I just really hope they can deliver on features and systems uh, and have a lot more than what we have seen of the game thus far. I do understand that there's supposed to be a pretty big emphasis on PvP in this one, although we've yet to really see that in action. Now, there is one other MMO that is scheduled to release in 2024. It's called Ashfall. But having played a beta just a few months ago... Mmm, Trashfall. This was the game I called so long ago. I said this game was going to be dog shit. I said that this game was going to be fucking trash. I was like, if you were to, to, like, you know, camouflage yourself as a toilet, as a public toilet, and open your mouth and allow people to shit into you for an entire day, it would be a less painful experience than trashful and what makes the experience even more painful is their setup their premise the world that the story all of that shit that they said that there was going to be involved and isn't involved in the game 
is really, really fucking good. An Asian-inspired, Fallout-esque game where the world has fallen apart and everyone is trying to get a hold of the MacGuffin. Or the, the Gek. Or I don't know what they call it in Trash Fall, I can't remember. But the fact that they fucked it up and they had such a good premise makes it hurt even more. Well, I'll tell you up front, don't bother. Uh, just, uh, it's absolutely not going to be worth your time. This is a mobile game being ported to PC and it yep. feels very lacking in many ways. The look, look, the look at the fucking, look at the fucking Matrix Sentinels that they ripped off there. This could have been such a good game. World, the systems, the gameplay. I disliked pretty much all of it, unless you just really enjoy phone games and phone MMOs. If that's the case, by all means, play it, have a blast. But if you are a PC or console focused gamer, I will not expect too much out of this one. So so those are all of the new MMOs we currently know have a release date planned and scheduled for some time in 2024. But I know at this point you might be asking yourself, hey, what about all those like highly anticipated MMOs from these big name, big budget AAA developers? Well, fact of the matter is, None of those are coming out in 2024, let's yep. be honest. Things like the Riot MMO set in League of Legends World. Man, Riot MMO is going to be so good when I'm 80 years old and I'm in an old age home. Runeterra, Blizzard's survival MMO that they kind of saw. Oh, Blizzard's survival MMO? You mean they're trying to recapture the magic of WoW Vanilla and they're not going to be able to and so they're going to be fucking having a panic attack and it's going to be falling apart? Of the Sony MMO in the Horizon universe. Or heck, there's even a Marvel MMO being made by Dimensional Inc. Yes, a lot of us are looking forward to these solely based on the developers and their pedigrees, but the fact of the matter is not a single one of them even have an official mm. reveal yet. We do mm -mm. not know the names of any of these games or anything about them, really. Nope. So no, we most certainly won't be playing any of these in 2024. But that is just really focusing on... Okay, okay, Riot MMO, I predict, will come out when I'm about... 75 years old if i'm lucky if i am lucky and i take enough pulls i'll still be able to get my dick hard for that one um for the ashes of creation mmo i am huffing so much copium you could consider me a drug addict for that game the, the brand new stuff. There's more in the MS, MMO, MMO sphere that we can expect to get that is new, and that's coming via expansions and updates. So there's a few things for World of Warcraft for one. We've got that War Within expansion they revealed at BlizzCon. <laughs> I feel bad for anyone who thinks War Within is going to be good. I feel really bad for them. Listen, I've been, I've been bent over and fucked like a schoolgirl on Epstein Island by World of Warcraft for years of my life. For years of my life. If you think the fucking stops now and they're going to give you a birthday cake, they're going to hand you the birthday cake and there's going to be dicks in the cake too. Uh, this is the That's first what's happening. of three planned expansions over the coming years. War Within oh, man. for 2024. Also in the world of mess. Warcraft, we got things like the classic era updates. Right now, Season of Discovery is in full swing. I've been playing it a lot since it released and have really enjoyed my time with it. It's just a cool new twist on classic World of Warcraft. And then at some point in 2024, they're going to be releasing the hardcore self-found. So no uh, streamers getting boosted. Actually, they probably will because they'll just form groups where people... Hey, there you go. He knows how works okay so season of discovery is probably the best thing that that um wow has going for it right now but the problem is it's a flavor of the month thing so if they don't continually update it and create new flavors of the month well everyone's going to get bored of chocolate ice cream at some point the problem with season of discovery is not the players it's the amount of bots that you're going to find in game and blizzard's going to use that as an excuse to be like oh guys Oh, we're so oh, we're so sorry. We can't we can't moderate all these bots. We better make a cash shop. That's what's gonna happen. And then there's gonna be the WoW token in there, and it's gonna ruin that part of the game as well. People basically do all the work <laughs> for them, and then they just collect the gear. But you know, for the regular people uh, that aren't getting boosted by an audience, it, it's a cool new twist to hardcore. And then outside of World of Warcraft, we know that Elder Scrolls oh, Online man. will be getting another year of updates. In fact, I should note, this is the 10-year anniversary. So e ESO is such a massive cock tease because the game is nothing like this trailer, right? I think he put this in his video because even he's too embarrassed to show what the, the, like, the actual gameplay of this game looks like. Soulman, who's an expert on this game, 
knows exactly how bad ESO is. Of its release. We'll keep playing so while we wait for that. It's a pretty big year for an ESO update. And then we get new stuff coming to Final Fantasy XIV with Dawn Trail. We expect new updates for Guild Wars 2. And frankly, most of the major MMOs are likely either getting big patches or expansions at some point in 2024. Outside of that, there is a very long list of still in development MMOs that we really aren't expecting. You know what? To Actually, that one does have to go on my list. To come out in 2024 likely 2025 or beyond we're talking about pax day soul frame arc age 2 Ooh, Bitcraft, pax day. project ragnarok hold on pax day that was another one that i wanted to look into i don't know how good that one's gonna do but i did see that people played a lot of it uh in the beta and they did love that one to the Echo, Chrono Odyssey, Odin, Valhalla Rising, The Quinfall. How about those crowdfunded games, right? Like Ashes of Creation, Pantheon, hey. Rise of the Fallen, Camelot Unchained. Yeah. Okay, Camelot Unchained, Pantheon, Rise of the Fallen are going to immediately be failures. I, I've looked at enough footage from both of those games to know that they're going to be either super, super niche or they're just going to die. Maybe it happens. Maybe I get... Also, Pantheon, Rise of the Fallen, I am almost certain that the pantheon rise of the fallen um team has hired an ai bot to go to people who speak negatively about their game uh, read the transcript of a video and then start posting comments saying how wrong they are about how pantheon rise of the fallen is doing because i can't believe that someone can be so delusional as to think that pantheon rise of the fallen is going to be the next world of warcraft get struck by lightning but we're not really expecting any of these games to come out in 2024 it's probably not happening the good news is besides the list of games that i did run through that are pretty much confirmed for this year as with prior years there's a good chance that some in development games that are nearing release or aren't on our radar or even haven't been officially revealed yet will come out in 2024 we can be taken by surprise some of these timelines could move forward and games that we don't expect to fully release may actually at the very least get something like an early access launch or if that Games, games never move forward in time. They always move backwards. If none of these things are in early access or early access has been announced or anything like that, it's likely not going to happen. Um, I'm even concerned about Ashes of Creation. Um, it might push its alpha back to 2025. I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. AOC had a showcase yesterday. I need to watch that then. That's not the case. We're right. bound to see. We'll get on to the next part of what I wanted to do today. For many, if not most, of the games that I just mentioned, while it's not a full release, there will still be opportunity to get some hands-on time with many of the games mentioned here. But regardless, seems like it's going to be a pretty decent year for MMOs. There is quite a lot here that I'm looking forward to. And yeah, 2024. Here's. <sighs> Hold on, I think my hearing's broken with many of the games mentioned here. But regardless, seems like it's going to be a pretty decent year for MMOs. There is quite a lot. Games mentioned here. But regardless, seems like it's going to be a pretty decent year for MMOs. There is I think something's wrong with my hearing. Maybe it's the video. There's quite a lot here that I'm looking oh. forward to. And yeah, 2024, here's to some new MMOs. And yes, as I said at the top, there's uh, probably a good chunk of the games that we talked about that will be on 2025's list as well. Yep. That's just the way it is, right? <laughs> All right, thanks. That's it. that's it for today. Thank you as always for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time, guys. Take it easy. Cool. Okay. So, I like his video. It was good enough. I... Are you fucking serious? I can't click the like button. Hey everyone, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, YouTube. I can click um, the dislike button, but I cannot click the like button. Beautiful. Wonderful. Even he, even YouTube knows he's lying about the um, <laughs> the MMO stuff. Okay, so.